Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. This episode, I'm sure as you can tell by the mat in front of you there, what we're going to be doing again. Um, sort of. Uh, this has definitely been one of my favorite games of 2020 so far. Um, I really have enjoyed this a lot. It's been very interesting. There's lots of little things going on. It's been eight plays of this, and I still, to quote Depeche Mode, I just can't get enough. I just can't get enough. And of course, the game we're referring to is Verdun 1916 Steel Inferno by Fellowship of Simulations. Um, really have had a lot of fun with this game. If I had to finish my 10 best new to me games this year, Right now, definitely number one. I probably have said that before with the previous videos I did, but seriously, um, it's just, it's been really, really good. Okay, now as you can see here from the board, I just finished up my eighth play, and um, things did not end well for the Germans. Um, it was pretty close until the last couple turns, and then the bottom fell out, um, especially after Fort, uh, and again, I'm not, I did not take French in high school, so Dumont, Dumont. Uh, was recaptured by the, the French and basically was stick a fork in the Germans, they're done. Alright, so this video, since I've already done a playthrough, I've already done a review, this video I decided to, kind of like my Stalingrad Inferno on the Volga um, video I did before, I'm going to talk about some of the gameplay, some of the cards, uh, some things I've observed. Now, again, a couple things. Number one, you know, your mileage may vary. You know, maybe you think I'm wrong completely on this. You know, you might have that moment of, like, rush hour where you want to look at me on the video screen and be like, what the hell did you just say? But, uh, again, it's just my thoughts, my musings after these plays. And also, of course, keep in mind this is from a solo perspective. Uh, and at the end of the video, I'll give um, a few of my uh, solo thoughts, too. Uh, adjustments and things that I've been trying to do uh, for the game as well, for the lonely uh, general here on the Western Front. Okay? Alright, so I'm going to start off with a couple of things here. The first thing I'm going to do is just going to make some general comments, strategy-wise and stuff, and then I'm going to talk about specific cards. Specific cards about the French and the Germans, and as I talk about them, I'm going to go ahead and lay them over here so that you guys can see the cards I'm talking about specifically. Okay? A couple of things. One thing that was really interesting about this game to me, and can really be a double-edged sword, is the discard option. Now, once the turn starts, with the seven rounds, you do have the option to discard two cards in your hand to dig through your draw pile and pull out a card that you want. Now you have to pass after you do that, of course. But this can be very interesting, especially for specific cards. Uh, I was just doing it here at the end of this last game where the Germans don't have too many barrage cards at the end and I had a bunch of those cards that was like Bury the Dead and, and uh, that card about lice in, in the trenches. And so I ended up discarding those cards to get some barrage cards to kind of, uh, so I could take some actions with it. Because of course in the game if you don't have barrage cards you can't do any kind of assault, uh, let alone inflict any damage on the enemy. So early in the game of course you can use them as the Germans to obtain some strong cards, you can do it as the French later in the game. But again you do have to be careful because it does use up a round. And it, it also it can be tough if you specifically go after a card and you can't find a way to use it if things don't go according to plan, which of course this is war so it's not supposed to. But I really do like the discard option. I, I think it's a neat mechanic uh, for this game. Another thing that is big for the game, and I've seen this in a couple of my own games before, is the whole air superiority bit. Um, now each side has some air superiority cards. Okay, and you can use these to get control of the sky. Now, the funny thing is that before I started this game, and, and I admit, I my knowledge about World War One is, is fairly limited. Uh, but before I started this game, I was like, here's superiority. What? We ain't talking about the Second World War here, right? I mean, we're dealing with, you know, the First World War. But it's interesting because I've been reading um, Catastrophe 1914 or 1914 Catastrophe, Max Hastings. And it's interesting how much they've talked about uh, the Royal Flying Corps doing reconnaissance and stuff, uh, how important that was. Even uh, the section in uh, the book A World Undone that I read about Verdun 
uh, is interesting. There's a lot of emphasis there. And in this game, it can be huge. I've had a couple of games where one side has really managed to run away with the air superiority, and it was just brutal, absolutely brutal. And having it even at just plus one to your side is important because then you get to totally re-roll your barrage dice on one attack if you want. Uh, and that can be critical, especially if you roll, say, six dice and you only get one hit. You know, you can re-roll six of them again. Um, so that is, that is very important. Air superiority, surprisingly, is very significant in this game. And, of course, if you play with all the cards, which there are three variant cards, Involved, then of course, you know, dun, 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 after the turn of the century, there he is, the Red Baron, um, is also in here to negate one of the allies' cards that is our that is in hand, discarded before it can cause any damage. But I guess the point I'm trying to make about this is, don't underestimate the air superiority. Um, it's really, really is a significant chunk of the game. It is amazing. Uh, the factor that it plays in the game, and you really can't afford to let your opponent run away with it. So if your opponent starts slamming, you know, gets uh, even at plus two to his side, you better do something about it fast. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself um, regretting it. I had that happen in one of my plays where the French got so far behind on the air superiority, it was just Snoopy couldn't even save it. Let's put it that way, right? All right, another thing that's interesting with some of the cards are the cards that are the ones that give you some extra VPs in the game. Now, the victory points in the game are based on forts, geographical locations, the edges of the map, but these cards here will allow you to put a marker in an enemy controlled space, obviously one you think you can get your hands on pretty quick, and then give you that as a new victory point space. Now the thing about that is that you can put them almost anywhere. So for example, like my last game here, actually if you look up here, I put one right up here, figuring for the Germans that I could capture this pretty quick, and then I did the same thing over here for again the Germans, but it didn't quite work out so well. And then this one actually did for the French, uh, because the Germans actually had a salient in here, um, and I managed to to crush that later on in the game. But you can place those down and they can be critical, uh, especially if you line up reserves well in that sector and basically not only capture that particular area, but then do like a defense in depth, you know, barrel your way into the next one and then you have all those guys set up, which remember you can move troops forward um, to fill the gap as you advance your forces. So these can be very, very important, but again, like a lot of things in this game, they can be very double-edged, okay? Because, again, the Germans put that one, I showed you the first one, they put that in pretty early in the game, and they just had horrible die rolls and never managed to capture it. So they basically were given the French a free victory point for the entire game. So you do have to be careful with them. They are very interesting. As you can see, there's two German and only one French, but given what the Germans were trying to do here and the significance uh, they were attaching to this, the kind of meat grinder attrition strategy, uh, it, I'm not surprised that the Germans have two cards to the French ones. But that's, to me, that's very, very interesting. And you do have to be very careful with how you play these. But it is an extra nice added element to everything. Another thing to keep in mind here, and there are quite a few of these, are the victory point cards. These ones can be timely and can cause a lot of damage, depending on when you do them. So there's two different types of them in the game. The first one is two that basically stay in the whole game starting with turn two, so starting with March of 1916, and there's one for each. There's a German and there's a French one. Now notice both of them are basically identical. You know, you can either get the two victory points because they're both propaganda cards, which at first two victory points you might be like, yeah, really? But you know what? As you play this game more often you come to find out that those two victory points can be very crucial, especially as the game is winding down. Okay. Um, they both have the same amount of action points. You can do it for four action points instead. And you, of course, still get an action point if you play it for the victory points. So these two are kind of very simple, um, the two pointers, if you will, uh, to get that. But the other ones, there's a lot more involved with them, depending on which sides you have here. Okay. Um, from the French perspective, there, of course, is the critical element of the psalm which the Psalm cards are important because of the victory points they can give for two turns, okay? And since they are black on their titles, that means they are reusable. So you can use them for both turns four and five. So if you're way far behind 
on victory points as the French, you can basically go ahead and pump those cards in by selecting them at the beginning of each month, because since they're eligible for both turn 4 and 5, then you basically have 4 chances at getting them into play, which means you basically should be able to if you really want to, unless you have something more pressing to deal with. But the Somme Offensive, of course, is very important, which of course it was during the war, too. And then the Brasilov, of course, is yellow, so that means after you play it, it is pulled out. Now, the Brasilov has a little more interaction with the German cards, uh, which is interesting because the Brasilov Offensive is the one that for the events in this game, it's basically, to me, it's the big event that either side, Germans or French, but especially the French, I guess, would have very little control over. Uh, one of my solo things I've done is any cards connected to the Russian front. There's two for the Germans, there's one for the French. I basically have made a rule where you can't select those at the beginning of any monthly turn, or you can't discard your two cards and pick that out of the draw pile. Um, basically, I have to let fate you know, lend a hand, so to speak. And again, it's because, you know, it's the Russians. And, you know, the Russians, historically, in my opinion, have always kind of operated by their own timetable, doing their own thing, so, um, kind of thing. So that is a house rule that I've made for um, for solo playing, uh, as far as that goes. So these event cards very important to the French. Now, the Germans have a number of event cards, too. They have a couple of Russian front cards, which they can use to rack up some victory points. And then, of course, they got the Romanian offensive here. Um, as in the summer of 1916, Romania very briefly, and I do mean briefly, joined the Allies. And then, basically, ah, no disrespect to the Romanians, but they got snuffed out like a candle. I mean, it didn't last very long at all. Um, as one book I read years ago, and it may have been the Lewis Snyder you know, kid, elementary kid book, um, talking about Romania, saying like there was a flash of lightning uh, in the summer of 1916, you know, comparing it to that, when Romania entered the war for the Allies, and it didn't last long. And, it, you know, like a flash of lightning, it was pretty much gone. Um, but these cards could be critical later in the game for the Germans, um, with the Russian offensive trying to get some victory points back, and the Romanian one, too, as well. Now, there's only one other card that I, is an event card that's a curious one to me, and this is the Jutland one, or Jutland, I guess, depending on how you want to pronounce things here. But this one's interesting because it is yellow. It is only one turn that you can do it. And, again, it can give you some victory points as the Germans, but it is this is a little riskier than the other cards, okay? Because here, as you can see from this chart, you can lose victory points as the Germans. You can lose five victory points, or you can get up to ten victory points. Okay? Now, the thing is that the French have a canceling card, which I'm going to talk about separately with the French, um, Jellico. Uh, I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Um, but to me, in my plays, um, the, the action points, there are four. But I really think that this is more important to get rid of that Jellico card because unlike the Utland card here in front of us which is only good for turn 3 Jellico basically runs turns 2 through 6 and that's 4 action points that the French have available to themselves for the majority of the game so if the French decline to play him to cancel the Utland event depending on where the victory point track is of course to let him stay in the game you know if you're like okay you know what I'll take my chances you can have your 10 victory points but I'd rather have the action points over and over and over again for the rest of the game as much as possible. Um, basically, while well, you're talking uh, potentially turns 3, 4, 5, and 6, so you're talking potentially four times more in the game, which that's 16 action points. That's a lot of action points. To me, I think it's worth it as the Germans. I don't, I don't think in my personal experience here with my plays, I don't find it beneficial for... The Germans to use it for the action points. It's better to either force the French to discard to block it or to say, okay, you know what, let's try and, you know, French basically do your worst and try and inflict that damage uh, and hold on to the Jellico card. So I think that one is a good one to play um, that way. And of course, I believe that happened at the end of May in 1916 is when this took place. Pretty sure. Turn three is May, June, so I think so. Okay. Now, talking about each side here, uh, individually, from the French perspective. So we'll start there. First of all, 
On turn two, this card here. The I'm gonna butcher this. I'm sure. I'm Voyez Sacré. Uh, you have to play this because this gives you twelve units that get to come into play without any victory point penalty. Um, this is a no-brainer for me. It has been ever since um, the second play to choose this at the beginning of turn two for the March month because you need those troops. You really do because that early part is really when the Germans have the best chance to go Russian for Verdun or grab two of those Red Star spaces. Okay, So to me, this is very, very important. Um, it does require, um, again, I'll probably butcher this, Castelno, Cas Castino. Um, but he, you start that with him in your hand at the beginning of the game, so you can quickly play that, um, which I personally I think you should play because it also gives you a free strategic move during the first turn. And, you know, get all that into the game. You need those troops. It's interesting because several of the books I've read recently about World War I talked about how the Germans really should have bombed this sacred way, this supply line that was feeding Verdun. And they didn't. They didn't hit it with artillery pieces at all, which is... You know, it does seem like a strange thing, but again, the German focus was on bleeding out the French on the front line. So, so this card definitely essential to French play. Okay, another essential card. Whoops, sorry about that. I think I bumped that one a little too much there. Apologize. Is the America card? Now, this card was a card that, quite frankly, at first I was curious when I. You know, I had a Scooby-Doo moment when I first saw that this was in the game. I was like, Raggy? Because it's like, really? The USA? 1916? But, um, you know, as I play the game some more, you know, what's kind of a big political factor? Uh, especially, I think, for the French. Now, I could be wrong about this. Because of, you know, trying to get the U.S. more involved. Especially after... Uh, the Battle of the Frontiers at the beginning of the war where, you know, the French army just bled itself horribly. Uh, I believe it was August 22nd. They lost 27,000 men killed in a day. I mean, stop and think about that for a second. 27,000. I mean, that's like the size of a small university football stadium. Gone. Single day. Just like a giant hand came down and swooped those people, you know, swept them away. You know, swooped down and swept them away kind of thing. So this is important, of course, because depending on what level the U.S. interest, entry, potential entry is, this can range anywhere from level zero, which is at the end the Germans get five extra victory points, all the way up to, um, I think it's five. Hold on, let me double check that. Let me sure I didn't miss. No, 15. I'm sorry, 15. I was, uh, five is the next level. So zero is 15. That's a huge chunk if you don't pay attention to this as the French. But even level one, the Germans will get five victory points. So you really got to, you know, bump this guy up to level two to get zero. And only level three, which I actually did for the first time. I've never got the U.S. to level three to this eighth game. will get you five extra points as the French at the end of the game. Uh, and again, you only have one chance per turn to start to play this once it starts to come into the game. So it is a critical one because you really don't want to leave it on level zero. That's almost suicidal, those 15 victory points. I mean, the French victory point track only goes up to negative 15. So, I mean, that's just, you're asking for trouble there. Okay, But it is an interesting card um, from that perspective. I, I found its inclusion in the game interesting, but at the same time, after these plays I've done, I also find it... Uh, 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 what's the word I want? I, I found it to be satisfying to have it in the game. It has been very interesting, even just from a play balance kind of thing. I found it to be very interesting. So, another French card that is important here is the Italian offensive card. Now, the Italian offensive card comes into the game on turn two, and then it does not leave... Um, until turn six, or until you play it for the events. Now, you only get victory points equal to 1d6 plus two. But a couple games ago, at the very end, what it was like, I think the Germans had like a plus two advantage going into the, to the very last December turn. I had this in my hand, and I opted to play it for the action points because I thought I could capture one of the victory point spaces. In the end, if I had just even... With the two victory points, I would have bumped it over to negative one to the French. 
So holding on to this until the end of the game, using it for the four action points, I think is very smart early in the game. Unless you're desperate. Unless the Germans have somehow managed to get close to 50, and I have not really gotten that high. I think the highest I've got on the victory point track is the Germans is somewhere around the low 20s, like 20 to 20 to 23 is as far. I've never gotten it higher than that. But this little jab here, and again, this is, I mean, this also is an event victory point, but I chose to highlight it because of how long it's in the game, how long it's an option on the table. So you can use it. Like if you're desperate, you're trying to keep the Germans away from the 50. Or at the end, if you, you're you like, okay, I need that little last infusion of victory points. Boom! You know, let me turn to the Italians to do it. Uh, this card to me is very important. And, and at first glance, it might seem a little eh. But it does play, in my opinion, it does play a very big role for the French player. Okay. Another French card. And I've kind of talked about this one already, so I'm not going to belabor the point or beat the dead horse, is, is the Jellico card. And again, as the French, if you think you'd afford to give up those maximum 10 victory points, remember, it could backfire on the Germans. They could lose 5 victory points. This, I think, is worth holding in your hand unless you're desperate. Unless you're really like, dude, I cannot afford to give up even 5 points right now. Because um, the action points you get for the rest of the game, uh, it's because it's eligible for turns two through six, unless you use it as the event. I, I just think it's huge to have that many action points. I mean, you know, think about everything you can do with the action points just with this card. You know, you could you could do a strategic move. You could call up some reinforcements. You could lay down trenches, and you could do a tactical move. I mean, it's huge what you can do with four action points in this game. So this one I think is very important for the French, and quite frankly, in my opinion, I would only give it up if I was really desperate in victory points. Otherwise, wouldn't do it. Another French card are, well, it's kind of a set of cards, really. This one is the low barrage cards. Now, at the beginning of the game, you know, as the French, you can be like, what the... You know, like, dude, what is this business here? Three barrage points? <laughs> you know, I, I think I'll go ahead and sneeze on the Germans, but I'll have the same effect. It is pretty bad early in the game, especially if you don't have air superiority where you can, can re-roll the dice. Um, especially if you, you know, you, you have troops that you're trying to send into a spot. Although, as the French, unless you really see, like, a, a low-hanging fruit kind of situation, or there's a chance to isolate... Um, some German troops, you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to use it. But to use them as well-timed barrages, you know, where you think, okay, the Germans have built up a lot of guys here. I think the next play, they're going into here to kind of disrupt things. I think that is, is good. Now, granted, since you can rotate units around in this game, it's not as important as it might be in other games, but it still can throw a monkey wrench into things, especially if you get a really good die roll. And the same is true of the Germans at the end of the game when they have their four barrage cards and they really don't have any strong ones left. You can, you know, throw a monkey wrench into the French plans. You know, a well-timed use of a low barrage card is nothing to sneeze at, so to speak. Ah, see what I did there? So, uh, you know, don't underestimate your low barrage cards. They, they are worth, worth things. Ah, I have a bunch of exhausted French now. <laughs> hmm. Okay. And then the other thing for the French that's important are the combo cards, okay? And there are a number of these that, you know, say, like, in order to do them, you know, like this one combines with, oh, geez, uh, I think that's Nivelle and Menguin, and then that combos into this, coordinated tactics, which is downright brutal. German forts absorb one less hit, French infantry inflicts one more hit. I mean, dude, that's huge the last two turns. So you have to be careful with them. If you're going to use them for action points, um, think think carefully about that if you really need to. And be very careful with this one here because as the text says, when you play him, whatever turn you play him from 3 through 6, which earlier better, um, or earlier the better, you have to be careful because if you don't use a barrage of any kind for any purpose, even just like a spoiling attack or just, you know, lob over a couple of shells to annoy the Germans kind of thing, you're going to lose him. And if you lose him, 
then you can't bring these other two into play. So you have to be real careful. So really, when you play this one, you better make sure you have a barrage card, because if you play this with no barrage, you will live to regret it. Now again, if you suddenly panic and we're like, holy smoke, remember, if you have at least two cards left in your hand, you can discard those two cards, go through your draw pile, and pull out a barrage card so you can fulfill that requirement and not totally screw this up. Because if this guy's gone, then those other two don't exist, okay? Um, that can be nasty business. All right, now switching, as Black Adder would say, to the Germans. The Germans have some interesting cards too. One of the most double-edged cards, or I should say a set of double-edged cards, is the Submarine Warfare cards. Now these cards basically will cost the French cards out of their hands. With the first one, the French get to choose the cards. With the second one, they're random. And now the problem, of course, the trade-off is, how much do you want to aggravate the United States of America? Because both cards will give a plus die roll modifier up to, if you play both of them as the Germans, it will end up being plus five, and you only need nine or better to bump the U.S. Uh, interest involvement, however you want to put it, level by one. So plus five, that's huge. <sighs> That's, you have to kind of think about these carefully. Now, these ones, I think, if you time them right, especially the second one, that's the random discard, that can be really, really big, uh, especially at a critical moment uh, in the later turns when you're trying to you know grab a spot or defend a spot and keep the French out, especially if the French have already kind of built up you know some of the U.S. involvement interest because... Remember, the French are only going to get a maximum of five victory points out of that. So, you kind of have to weigh that and weigh it carefully. I have to admit, I rarely have used them as events. I've used them more for their action points. Because, you know, if the French... I, I want to make the French work for increasing the U.S. level. Let's put it that way. And I feel like the subcards, unless you have a really good reason, you know, you really shouldn't play them for the events. Except for the second one. You know, if you you suspect the French have something in their hands, or especially if you're playing solo and you know what's there, and then you know you're just going to shuffle up the cards and have to discard two of them, um, that can be really big. But you have to handle these with care, which I guess one can argue is part of the story with uh, the German submarine warfare campaign. Anyway, but on the other hand, when I play the lamps are going out, I always put the German subs in the unrestricted box from the get-go just to pound on the British because I want to deprive them of those production points. So, and this game is a little more complicated in my opinion. So, you got this, this, these are, these are two cards to really, really think carefully about. I'll actually have them backwards. This is the one that's the random one which comes in later in the game on turns five and six. So, um, you know, you really want to be very careful with how you handle those sub cards. All right. Next, um, the big fort cards. Now, if you don't get some of these, what I call the big fort cards, uh, because there are a couple of them. You know, at the beginning of the game, you have Disarmed Fortress, which can be huge. Then you have the Lunar Landscape. And notice all these are only available for one turn only. You know, it's like a one night only kind of concert sort of thing. And, you, you know, people are running around desperately shaking fistful of money to, um, to try and get tickets. If you don't get, especially this one, the Disarmed Fortress, this one's the trickiest one of the group because not only do you need to get it, you need to get to a fort, which usually would be Domon, to try and use it to its maximum advantage. Okay, So this one's especially tricky at the beginning because if you don't get it as part of the draw, you're going to have to discard two of your cards to get your hands on it. This one here is a little easier to get a hold of, and so is the Falkenhayn one. But again, if you don't get them... Uh, you know, how much investment do you put into it? Quite frankly, it depends on the position of the board. You know, it's kind of like a game of chess. You know, a pawn is, is the lowest in the ranks and stuff, but on the right square, they can checkmate the king. It, it's kind of that way with these barrage cards. But especially this first one, you have to be very careful because there's no other way to get it unless you actually get it in your deal on the opening turn. And granted, the Germans get 10 cards. But I've had quite a few games where I don't get it. And then you have to look at the rest of your hand and be like, okay, so is it worth discarding two of these cards to get a hold of that? Can I get to the fort uh, in time? Uh, can I get to any fort because of where the starting lines are at the beginning of the game? Because it, 
basically to get to um, Domon, you have to go through at least, I'm looking here at the map, one, two, you have to capture, as the Germans, you got to capture at least two spaces to get adjacent to it, to even have a chance to capture it. So you kind of have to weigh that uh, as part of it too. But these can be very powerful, but again, you know, if you don't actually draw them, as part of your hand or you don't choose them at the beginning of the month with these two particular ones then you kind of have to weigh and decide you know is it really worth it another German card and this to me is one of the most important cards that Germany has in the entire game is this gas card this gas card is huge it's available for the first three turns and to me it's so big because it causes all the defending units to be exhausted, okay, to tip themselves over, if you will, in the parlance of the game, and then you can use a barrage of eight dice, which again, if you combine that with air superiority early in the game, that could be huge, because, you know, hey, if I roll eight dice and I only get three hits, pff, well, forget that, I've got air superiority, I'll re-roll them all. Um, and you also don't have to worry about friendly fire sixes as well, too, because um, you can have that happen, too, if you don't have the air superiority. So this one is available for the first three turns, and it is crucial. This is this is a card that I would I would definitely discard two cards in my hand to get a hold of it if I didn't have it in my hand, uh, especially on the first turn, because this you can't underestimate exhausting those defending units. Fresh unit defending units inflict three points of hit damage in any assault. So if you could exhaust them right away, why wouldn't you? Okay. So this is a card that you definitely need to have in your hand as the Germans every single turn for those first, for every single month for those first three turns. You gotta have it in your hand. You, you just have to. Um, well, I should say each turn because, you know, like if, for example, on turn two, if you play it in March, then once it's at the discard pile, you can't get it back. There's no mechanic in the game to do that. You can't go through the discard pile and ever bring back a card from the dead, if you will, um, once it's in the discard pile. But this gas card is is valuable is is crucial in my opinion to german success early in the game so you know you really got to you got to know how to use this you got to you know like fast time at Ridgemont high you know they're talking about no shirt no no shoes no shirt no dice yeah you know live it learn it know it same thing with this got to know that gas card got to use it and maximize it uh, Infiltration is another German card that's available for the first three turns. And this is one that you really want to use early and often before the French really have a chance to beef things up. Playing it on the first turn is absolutely crucial because if you break through that thin French line, you can quickly and swiftly get into a second spot. And of course, as I was just saying before about the Disarmed Fort card, um, getting adjacent to Fort Dumont or any fort is a bit of a trick and a challenge at the beginning of the game. So this one can help you because, you know, you bust that first line, the space behind it's empty, you can go ahead and fill that vacuum and, and be set up for the next turn to you know, continue to plunge, excuse me, toward the French forts. So the infiltration card is very, very important as well, too. I don't think I ever play this for the action points either, to be honest. I, I find it too strong to spend on the action points. But again, your mileage may vary. You never know. Speaking of critical cards, this is another card that I would absolutely discard if I didn't have it. This flamethrower card. It's only good for the first two turns, but it is a permanent card. Once you put it in play, you have its benefit. And again, it may not sound like much to be like, oh, you know, one extra uh, point in combat for attacking German units, but that extra point can can be significant, can tip the scales at times, can clear a space, you know. A, a, a crucial point where you're like, oh, well, my my infantry, you know, inflicted two points of damage, but there's a French trench there. Well, shoot, it drops down to one. I can't get rid of that exhausted French unit, but hey, I got my flamethrowers. Then the one point goes to the trench. I got two points left. Boom, I'm in business. So again, this is a card as a German player at the beginning of the game. If I didn't have it in my hand, I would give up two cards in my hand to get a hold of it and get it permanently into play for those two turns uh, at the beginning of the game. Because it's just, it's going to help you with all of your assaults, okay? Um, and then the other one to really talk about here 
are the Russian front cards. Now the Germans have two of them, okay? And one of them they can draw reinforcements from Russia, which basically they get one extra unit for victory points, for less for the same victory points. So you get four units for three victory points. But you are going to end up um, the Brasilo Offensive, the victory points are doubled. So again, this is the kind of card that is the Germans. If you think you're on the verge of winning, then it makes sense to put this into play and keep it into play until the Brasilo Offensive is unleashed. Otherwise, it's not worth the risk. You're better off playing the other one where you're going to subtract three victory points. I believe it's subtract three victory points from... Let's the text here real quick. But I'm almost 100%. Yeah, subtract three victory points from the Brasilov Offensive you know, if you're doing the opposite, which is sending reinforcements to Russia, which means for every three victory points you give up, you only actually get two German units. Okay. So again, if you're playing a little more conservatively, if you're like, okay, I grabbed a bunch of space, now I need to hold on to it um, and weather the storm, it would make more sense to go ahead and do that with those. And again, the, the interplay of those, the guessing game of what's in the opponent's hand uh, is critical. And that's part of the reason why, like I said, for solo play, I, I don't make any of these cards. I don't allow them to be chosen. They have to just show up randomly um, because they, are, they, they can play a big role. And again, you know, we're talking about interactions with Russia, which, you know, Russia is a riddle shrouded in mystery wrapped in an enigma, as Churchill said. So trying to figure out what they're up to all the time is not exactly the easiest thing to do. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the cards for both sides. Some of them. I mean, I haven't gone over all of them. There's some other ones too. But to me, you know, like some of them, like for example, this this French card here, the Hospitals card, which basically will give you a boost of three morale points every single month. I mean, to me, that's like a no-brainer. As soon as you get a hold of it, put it in the game, man. I mean, you know, it's, it's for good for the entire game, too. That's huge. Uh, you got to do that. So, the other thing I just want to mention real quick, and I probably should have done it the first part of the video, but I forgot to put it down on my talking points, is supply. Supply in this game is brutal. Because once you get a unit cut off, that unit can't move, it can't fight until somebody gets through. I had a game a couple games ago um, where... I I had kind of, you know, because sometimes I'll, I'll play a couple of, t of rounds on a turn that I'll go away and come back just to kind of give a little separation uh, and kind of a little fog of war confusion when I initially come back, you know, trying to remember what was I thinking about. And I got some French units cut off, and I desperately was trying to get to them, but I couldn't get my way through. And, you know, basically you only have two rounds to do that because once they're cut off, then it's level one, level two, boom, it's over. And they're considered destroyed for the p purposes of morale. They're out of the game. Uh, not permanently. Of course, you can you can put those blocks back in the supply. But it, it, it can be significant. Now, granted, it's not the easiest thing to do. This is World War One. This isn't World War Two. So, you know, you don't have the, the ability to, to isolate things as easily um, as, you know, when you've got tanks. But the supply rules in this game, you do have to be careful. You do have to watch for opportunities because you get somebody cut off. And, you know, it's kind of like the, the German 6th Army at Stalingrad. You know, once it was weakened and stuff, the only way to get them out is for somebody to pound their way in from the outside. And that's the situation here. All right. Now, next time around... Uh, I'm not 100% sure yet. I am looking at two games to do as a possible video here. One of them is Revisiting Guns of August, um, which I haven't done a video on, but I've, I've played, and uh, I have very serious, ambiguous feelings about that game. And then the other one is the Ted Ray Sear game, The Glories and When Eagles Fight uh, combo pack from GMT that I still need to take a look at, but I'm not sure which one of those games uh, I'm going to focus on for the next video. It def it, it's I'm about 99% sure it'll be one of those two. I'm leaning toward Guns of August because from what I've been reading and such, the chit pull seems to me is, is, is a good match for what happened in the first month of the war. But there's something, and I mentioned this on Board Game Geek on one of my... Um, there's a couple of lists, solitaire games on your table, war games on your table. I mentioned it there. And Judd Vance... Uh, who's a very active member of the the wargaming community, um, 
he basically said that he agreed with with my thoughts about there's just something missing in the game. There's something, you know, I I, I likened it to, you know, like you're making a, a red sauce for like spaghetti, and and you take a little you know a little taste, and you're like, you're like something's not right. Something's missing. And actually, I feel that way about a lot of Worthington games, to be honest. I I don't know if I'll buy another one, to be honest. I mean, other than I did, I did total disclosure here. I I did do the Kickstarter for the Pickets Charge one, which I forget what that one is. But to me, that's a little bit different because that's already a tried and true product. And Herman Lutman, to me, is one of the the best solitaire designers out there. Um, I've, I've, I don't think there's been any of his games that I haven't enjoyed. Let's put it that way, that I've got my paws on. So that's a little different because it's a known quantity. But other ones have kind of left me flat. So I'm kind of playing around with the Guns of August, seeing if I can find a way to, um, to, to figure out what it is that's bothering me about it. You know, it's like when you're trying to remember something in the back of your head, you're like, ah, it's crawling around in there. Where is it? That's the way I feel about that. So it's going to be one of those two games. I'm not sure which one, but my World War I continues to roll on here. I'm, I'm a little surprised myself, I'm going to be honest, because World War I is one of those topics that I've not really had a whole lot of interest in ever since I found out about it when I was, you know, like a teenager. Um, got really into depth into it. But, you know, maybe that's it. Maybe that's, maybe that's the thing is that, you know, I've done so much reading on the Eastern Front and Pacific Theater World War II and you know, Cold War stuff and things that, you know, maybe that's part of the reason I'm still running with this is, you know, I'm reading these books and I'm learning so much uh, about World War One that I had no idea uh, and had no clue existed. So, all right, so there you go. There's some thoughts and ideas and analysis of some of the cards and, and some other things, a little more in-depth approach, if you will, to... Um, to Verdun 1916 Steel Inferno, which again is is the front runner right now for me for the best game, best new to me game of the year. Now, granted, there's a few games coming out later in the year, especially Race to Moscow, that might give it a run for its money. Black Swan too, hopefully, will be out before the end of the year um, from Venta Nuovo Games. We'll wait and see. But right now, it's the clear favorite. You know, it's like the Secretariat of the group of games I've. I've learned this year so far. All right, as always, I appreciate you watching. This is Tim Corsley from Bare Bones Wargaming saying I'll see you next time once again from the Western Front. I just don't know if it's going to be chip pull or non chip pull. Racier or I forget who designed Guns of August, but GMT or Worthington. I don't know which one it's going to be. We'll have to wait and see. Um, I'll surprise you. <laughs> All right, as always, thanks for watching. See you next time.